a really wonderful talk on digital humanities in the archive, looking at challenges of taking the Hidden Years Music Archive uh, online. I'm quickly checking, are we already recording? Yes, we are recording. Uh, okay, so I, I very much, I'm, I'm very happy to, um, to introduce uh, Lisa B. Lambrecht. She's the um, Director of Archives at the uh, African Open Institute for Music, Research and Innovation uh, at Stellenbosch University. She holds a Volkswagen Stiftung Senior Research Fellowship and is responsible for the Hidden Years Music Archive. And that's one of the uh, biggest popular music archives in South Africa. As a researcher and curator, she strives to offer dynamic perspectives on the complexities of such collections and our exhibitions and publications reflect on uh, the construction of the archive memory and place in South Africa. She serves on the ex executive committee of the South African Society for Research in Music. And I think she's going to uh, tell us more about the archive now. Uh, I'll stop my sh screen sharing and then uh, the floor is yours. Uh... Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that, for that introduction and the opportunity to speak to all of you today um, and to share my work um, on the Hidden Years Music Archive. So as Meno mentioned, um, I work as the Director of Archives at Africa Open um, and I also work as an academic. And my, my history with the archive and working as an archive practitioner really started right after I graduated with my PhD in 2012, when I was offered the opportunity to bring the Hidden Years to Stellenbosch University to sort and preserve this archive and also to, to research the collection. Um, <laughs> taking in this archive has led me along a very interesting path. And while I trained as an audiovisual archivist, my academic work also turned towards my practice as an archivist. And this has grown to a point where I really struggle today to see my work as an archivist or as an academic without the other aspect of it. So as an archivist, I really work as an academic and as an academic, I actually also still work as an archivist. Um, I hope to, through my talk, to actually explain that a bit more to you today. So my responsibilities have since expanded from taking on the Even Years collection. And I now also manage all the other archive projects and aspects at Africa Open. And working with all these various digitization projects and processes has left me with a number of questions. Um, and I, I hope to unpack some of these with you today through my talk. So to do this, um, I'm first briefly going to outline where my thinking comes from. So a little bit of theory, not much, a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to move on to tell you the story of the Hidden Years Music Archive. So where the archive comes from, how it was created and collected, so that you can get a sense of the historical significance and content of this archive. And then I'll move on to discuss one particular digitization project in 2016. Um, during which the bulk of the documents and the photographs of this collection was digitized. And we are now in the process of making this material available online. And through that making available, we are asking a number of questions. And I, I hope that you as a group of digital humanities and digital scholars will also be able to actually advise us and help us think through some of these challenges that we have. Um, so without further ado, <laughs> um, I would like us to think of a frame for my talk today um, to, to help us to think critically about what happens when we create an archive. So be it a digital or a physical archive, um, what happens when we digitize physical material and we curate it online? So if we think of an archive as a specific place, housing material, be it digital or physical, we think of an institution primarily concerned with preserving and collecting. So in order to fulfill these functions, an archive generates inventories, catalogs, classifications, descriptions, and so on and so on. Now these archival systems are conceived for specific purposes. 
and created within particular contexts and times in order to serve the information needs of those who establish and maintain them. So through all of these processes, individuals like myself or like David Marks who collected the archive, um, institutional spaces and contexts are all involved in the process of archive making. And this is an intricate web that emerges, which is continuously working towards creating the archive. So the archive is never a fixed or set thing. It's always in the process of becoming. And we can also think about these knowledge as practices and technologies that form the core of archival practice um, as not neutral. And this, of course, includes digitization. So Antoinette Burton wrote very beautifully that archives do not simply arrive or emerge fully formed, nor are they innocent of struggles for power in either their creation or their interpretive applications. All archives come into being as a result of specific political, cultural, and socioeconomic pressures. Now, these pressures are mediated by archivists and archival processes, such as the people who created the archive, the systems conceived in place to turn objects into archival material worthy to be kept in a public space, while other documents are discarded and, in theory, forgotten. So understanding these processes, how archives are formed, instituted and maintained, are important for curators, for scholars and archival users, because the material available for them to use is not neutral and innocent, but part of the ideological processes of determining what is remembered, what is forgotten, and what is available for the writing of history. Now, I'm sure that most of you would have heard these ideas before, these are not new, and in some aspects, um, I suppose we are all a little bit fed up with hearing these things about the archive, about power, about politics, how the archives are created. But within this discourse that's mostly um, um, promulgated by scholars and academics, what we don't really talk about is how digitization is another form of selecting and curating this archive. We tend to somehow think that when we find material online, that that is what is available from the archive. But what we don't, and what we don't think about is that the archive was selected, physical, if we, if, we, if we take that, it was created. And then there was another process of curation and, 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 and selection that took place. And then quite possibly another one in making that of material available online. So that's what I want us to actually think about when we get to the end of this talk. Um, but before I get into more detail about that, let me tell you about the actual archive, about um, yeah, where it comes from and how it was created. So I just want to share my screen with you um, because I selected a number of very beautiful images from the archive. Um, okay. So I just want to make sure because now I can't see anything. Can you see my screen? and the presentation. Uh, I can't yet, but that might be my my personal setting. Um, I actually, I think I did something wrong. There we go. I need to share my screen share. One would think that after having done this for a long time, <laughs> want to do this. OK, yep, so now I, now I can see it. <laughs> there we go. All right, so everybody can see. Okay. All right, so let me just get my notes in order. So um, the Hidden Years Music Archive was collected by this man that you see on screen by David Marks. And he had a famous slogan that if it murmured or moved, we recorded it. So through his practices, um, he collected an, a unique archive that documents alternative popular music and the counterculture in South Africa from 1967 to 2005. The collection is estimated at roughly 10 tons of material. And this archive uses sound, um, images, newspaper cuttings, posters, programs, and other documents to recount this history of South African music. My notes got stuck. 
Um, in this archive, we found we find encounters between different races, between different musics, between different classes. Um, people and music that were in apartheid South Africa were kept apart. So as its name suggests, the hiddenness of this archive is primarily due to the non-commercial and oftentimes political nature of this music, which tended to circulate outside of the conformist spaces of a musical mainstream. Now, David Marx was ideally placed throughout his career in music to assemble this collection. As a young man, he played in a variety of bands in Johannesburg and Durban. And while working on the mines in Johannesburg after he left school, he frequented folk music clubs like the Troubadour and Lechaim. So all these experiences and meeting folk musicians like Jeremy Taylor, for example, who wrote that famous song, Ach, Please, Daddy. I don't know if you guys would know that. Um, and other musicians like Keith Bandal and Des Lindberg. David got to know folk music and he wrote his very famous song, Master Jack, made famous by Four Jacks and a Jill in 1968. Now this song to this day is the most, is the South African song that has been on the international billboards for the longest time. It's quite a, quite a feat, oh, let me just move on. I'm gonna play you a small clip of the song just so you can get a sense of what it sounded like. Um, there you can see the troubadour, you can also see David Marks, he won a sorry for the song. So let me play you a song. <laughs> It's a strange, strange world we live in, Master Jack. He taught me how to know the world, never look my head. It's a very strange world, and I thank you, Master Jack. You took a curly ribbon from out of the sky, and taught me how. Sorry, that was quite rapid. Ooh. I actually wanted to fade it out. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna actually throughout this talk play you a number of songs if I have time. I don't think I'm gonna have enough time, but I'll play you small little snippets so you can get a sense of the kind of music and the kind of material that is within this archive. So what you've heard now, it sounds very 1960s, very 1970s English folk music. And there is a large part of that music within the archive. Okay, so continue with our, with our narrative. David Marks often refers to the Hidden Years Music Archive as the house that Master Jack built. Because with the royalties of that song, David could um, organize festivals and concerts. And he also used that money to travel to America in 1969. So in America, David found work with the Bill Hanley Sound Company. Now Bill Hanley was becoming very well known for his sound development or sound design in America. Because you must remember during the late 1960s, you couldn't just buy a sound system out of a box like we can today. Every event, every venue, it had to, they had to design a sound system specifically for that venue and custom build that system. So, with Bill Hanley basically perfecting this art in the late 1960s, he was asked to do the sound at various large music festivals. And David went along on these rides to actually learn his trade as a sound technician. Now, um, let me just see, there we go, there's some photographs. So all of these pictures that you're gonna see in, uh, in my presentation was also taken by, by David Marks. Um, and during this year, 1969, he worked at, for example, the Monterey Jazz or Pop Festival. He worked at the Newport Folk and Jazz Festival. Um, he mixed sound for John Lennon and Joko Ono at the Toronto Rock Revival, Joan Byers, Madison Square. I mean, it's, the stories are, are endless and very beautiful in the way that David recounts it. Um, this was also the year you would recount of Woodstock. So David was one of two South Africans that we know of that was at the most famous Woodstock Music Festival. Um, and David was, you can see him here sitting on um, one of the sound fires at the Woodstock Music Festival. 
he was tasked by Bill Handley. I think they took shifts to do this, but he, this was one of his shifts where they had to keep people off these sound towers because they were scared that it was going to fall, was going to fall over onto people's heads. Um, so at this festival, David, because of his vantage points on these sound towers and also with the sound desk, which was very high up, I, I don't think I have a picture of that. Um, David could take very beautiful photographs. So here you can see Santana and Jimi Hendrix. Um, these pictures are used basically in all the documentaries on Woodstock, all the books, exhibitions. This was quite a significant moment in, in David's life. Um, and these photographs are absolutely astounding. So <laughs> to move our story along, I'm, this, it's, it's difficult to tell this history if I can just interject myself shortly because there's so many amazing little tales and anecdotes that hook onto all of these things, but I'm gonna not go into them. <laughs> um, so this was 1969. David came back to South Africa at the end of that year, so early 1970. And when he came back, he took over the directorship of the third year music company which was a small independent record label. And they focused on promoting and producing music and musicians who were not recorded by the mainstream record companies or received any radio airtime on the state controlled South African Broadcasting Corporation. Because this music was either considered as too political or the music was not considered as commercial enough so it wouldn't make enough money. Um, so David coming back to South Africa wanted to put on similar kinds of events and shows that he experienced and worked with in America, but he didn't have a sound system. So he couldn't really do that. So the kind of shows that he put on during that year was called small. It was in intimate coffee clubs and little bars in Johannesburg, and also some of them in, in, in Durban. Um, and then something really wonderful happened. Bill Hanley sent David a sound system. And the sound system that he sent David was actually part of the system that was used at the Woodstock Music Festival. Um, so the system that came, you can see it here in the picture, and also you can see the, um, the third year music label or brand. Um, but the system that came was the first big sound reinforcement system that came to Southern Africa. So that of course made David a, quite a sought after sound technician um, and, and, and festival organizer. And these systems, so the sound system became known as the Woodstock bins. And some of the earliest live reinforcement that David did was, for example, for African American musicians, Brooke Benton and Percy Sledge, who toured South Africa in the early 1970s. So, a whole story around that, because of course they came to South Africa against the cultural boycott. Um, but, blocking, blocking that. <laughs> um, so I just want to make sure that I have everything. So apart from the big shows that David was involved with, he also kept working in the smaller coffee clubs and smaller, smaller bars in Johannesburg, as I mentioned. Um, and within these spaces, he managed to put on, obviously within his community of musicians and fellow organizers, quite special events and special concerts. You can see they on the left hand, top left hand corner, should be like that on your screen. There's a concert, one of the first ones of Johnny Clegg and Sifu Nkunu at the Market Theatre Cafe in Johannesburg. Next to that, you can see David Copeland and Malombo with Philip Tabane, um, a township jazz outfit from Soweto, absolutely astounding music. Um, you can also see the Chelsea Theatre at the bottom and the Troubadour, it's the inside of the Troubadour in your, in your right hand corner. Now, if you just look at the makeup of these photographs, I mean, these kinds of events and these kinds of mixed audiences and mixed groups are not something that we really associate with 1970 South Africa. Because um, you must remember, this was a time of censorship. This was a time when the South African Broadcasting Corporation and the government um, was they were censoring all kinds of information coming into the country, for example, in news. They were censoring music that was happening within South Africa. Everything here was set up to keep the races separate. So 
recording studios, venues, um, life was built around keeping people, making sure that music did not mix, that people did not mix. So this archive, in the way that David put on shows, in the way that this community of musicians functioned, um, that's also why I refer to it as a counterculture or as alternative popular music. They found loopholes within the system to actually make these kinds of concerts and make these kinds of events possible. So having a collection where we can go back and we can retrace events like this, things that have largely been forgotten. We don't, we don't write about these things in music history per se at the moment. So we can actually go back now and we can go and discover these things within the archive. So let me just play you a small clip of this concert of 1976 of Johnny and Sipo. It's a beautiful recording. I'm going to try and play you a bit more of it. Let me see my time. So, okay. Perfect. Okay. This is a live recording in this thing. <laughs> So one thing that I didn't mention about the live recordings in this archive is what we can hear now, is that they're quite magic in the sense that we can hear the audience, we can hear the kind of things that were said on stage, we can hear the gossip between the musicians of whose trumpet is out of tune, um, we can hear jokes, we can hear the audience screaming things back at the musicians on stage. So in a way, because of the way that the music was recorded, some of these recordings are not fantastic. Um, the levels won't be right, or you know, it would be a little bit out of balance. But um, we can hear these interactions that really create a sense of what life was like during this time. And I think that's 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 quite special. Anyway, before I talk about that too much and move on. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so I spoke about some of the early big festivals that David did with his sound system. And um, to give you a bit more detail about these things, you can see there in the left-hand corner a photograph that was taken at the Free People's Concert. 
which is a festival that David started in the 1970s on a beach in Durban, um, because it was the only space that was available to host the interracial event in Durban at that stage. And then in 1971, that concert or festival was moved up to Johannesburg, University of Wits, and it was performed there until 1991, this festival kept going. So it's almost 20 years of music that was put on in Durban. And it was quite magic because at this festival, um, you had everything from very strange jazz music or um, psychedelic kind of rock music. You had township jazz, you had rock and roll, punk music, um, people playing gypsy jazz. You also had what was them like banjo players anyway. So the kind of music that was mixed there, the kind of audiences that was drawn by that kind of music was quite special for, for that time. You also see there the Lesotho Music Festival. So because of censorship and the bannings in South Africa, a lot of musicians chose to actually go and play in our neighboring countries. So Lesotho, Botswana, Zimbabwe, um, Iswatini, and a lot of those festivals was David was involved with them. And he actually recorded that music as well. So in a sense, this archive also represents the music of Southern Africa during especially the 1970s, what was happening. Um, you can see also there a photograph of Brenda Fassi in Kings Park Stadium, 1987. Um, David did the sound for, for that event. There's a beautiful story around what actually happened at that concert because, of course, 1987, states of emergency, things in South Africa was, was quite rough at that point. So, And that was also um, seen in the music of that time in the way that audiences reacted. And then just to show you, there's a, um, a small photograph of a permit that, that David applied for to actually have a concert. Um, I think it's Jabulani Amphitheatre in Soweto, but I'm not sure now. So we have a number of these permits in the archive. And David also always tells that he had to fill these in, so he did, but he never signed them. So I don't know if that's true necessarily. In the archive, we also own a thousand songs where we own the copyright to. Now, the recordings that David made through third year music within his, um, you know, throughout his life was never very, it was never co commercially successful. And that this was because it was musicians that maybe didn't um, have large followings or um, it was music that was political, so it was never advertised or you could never hear this on, on the radio, like I mentioned earlier. So some of the very beautiful and interesting ones for me is this recording live in Lesotho, which is a recording of Yuma Sekela um, made in Lesotho in 1977, I think, and they released it in 1978 on the Down South record label, which David Mark started with Yuma Sekela. Um, you can also see the Malombo Music of the Spirits album. This is an incredible album. Both of these have been reissued now. Um, one by Matsuli Records and the other one by an international company. Uh, and you can also see The Road is Much Longer by Roger Lucy. And I'll just quickly to tell you about, also to give you a sense of, of, of the archive and the kind of music that we're looking after. So the Roger Lucy album is one of the only albums that was officially banned within the country. Um, if you had this album in your possession, you were either charged with 10,000 Rand, um, and I looked it up right now, it would be 350,000 Rand fine for having an, a record album. <laughs> it's quite amazing. Or if you couldn't pay that, five years in jail. Um, so that was for possession or distribution. And um, that was because of the song, one, two, three lines from the top in the cartoon, you'll see Lungile Tabalaza which is a song that Roger Lucy wrote about a man jumping from John Foster Square. Um, but we know that the police and that police brutality in that time, they, a lot of people were pushed out of the windows or tortured. Um, the, so Roger Lucy has quite an interesting story where the security cop who was assigned to follow Roger, he also followed Johnny Clegg and Sipo and Kunu, for example. Um, but he, Paul Erasmus, would throw tear gas down the vents when Roger Lucy or Johnny and them were, were, were having a show. So obviously it would clear out or he would threaten um, uh, coffee club owners or, or, um, or venues to close down shows. So Roger Lucy's career was effectively ruined. 
um, Paul Erasmus did receive amnesty at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for, for his acts with Roger Lucy. Let me move on. <laughs> Big story. Uh, oh, yes. So just one more example, and then I'm, then I'm going to stop from the archive. So one thing that David did a lot, which is also why this archive came to be the way that it, that it is, is that he would record music, for example, you can see on the left, the psychedelic rock group Freedom's Children. He would record them and then take that cassette tape to Malombo and play that to them and vice versa. And so he also introduced musicians to each other. And what we have here is quite a particular event where David had both of these groups of musicians up in the Valley of a Thousand Hills, I think it's in Pietermaritzburg, and they wrote a rock opera together. And David recorded this whole jam session of the two groups. Um, and you can actually hear them transforming their sounds and how the influences the one group and the other group started having an impact. Um, I'm not going to play you the song, I'm sorry, I'm running out of time, but it's super interesting. It's like this weird psychedelic rock and you have this township jazz and the drums coming. It's amazing. Okay, but I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, so that was, oh, sorry, this is a bit quick, but that was a little bit of the story of the archive, just to give you a sense of why this is so special and why it's so important for us to think about things when we curate a collection like this or make it available. Um, so to come to me and to the archive processes, including digitization that actually formed this archive. So when this archive arrived in Stellenbosch, it came, well, it came to us in two, in two chunks. The first one was this one in 2013. I look very young and very happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it was so we had we got all of this it's 10 tons of material it was in boxes um, there were 6,000 reel to reels 4,000 tapes 8,000 vinyls 25,000 photographs it keeps going it was a it's a really really big collection um, and we started unpacking and working with this but what this archive did is with it coming to us in in well in its size it basically caused from its beginning storage problems so we had no place to store the archive this is actually in the green room of the music department the musicians were not happy that I was taking up their rehearsal space or their, their space before concerts but there it was and the storage troubles continues with our digital archive as well I'll get to that in a bit I'm going to move a bit quicker now so we can have time for, for discussion um, so there you can see some of the actual archive content. Um, it's an interesting collection because this archive very much was David's life. It documents his life and his journey through his music career. Um, his personal life intersects with the archive all the time. And that also makes it quite difficult to actually curate this collection because what do we keep and what do we not keep? I mean, when I got this archive, there were even curtain railings within the actual boxes. So, um, what I, what I do a lot is deaccession or throw material away. So my role in shaping this collection is quite a drastic, it's quite a drastic one. Um, okay, so we got that in 2013. In 2016, we got the other part of the archive. So David kept a lot of the material that, that he really cared about or that was really beautiful. He kept at his home in, in KwaZulu Natal. Um, and I knew that if I wanted to understand this archive and if I wanted to get to the history of this archive, I really needed to understand the material that David kept. So it was, it was, it took a, it was, it took three years to convince David to let it go. Um, and I think there were a number of factors we can talk about it, but I think one of the one of the ones that impacted it was that excuse me, <clears throat> he saw that. The archive was deteriorating quite rapidly because it was his material was kept like in on the coast in Durban. It's the most tropical place we have in South Africa. It's not good for archives at all. Um, he didn't have space, so the things that weren't in his house was in storage rooms. You can see two pictures there at the on on the right. These are friendly audience friendly ones. The rest were it was it was really in, in, insane to see where he kept his archive. Um, and the other thing that I think that let him let his, his material go was that we made a we made a deal that I would digitize every single item before I move it to Stellenbosch. 
<laughs> did I know? So I relocated to, to KZN for seven months. Um, oh, before I, you can see there some of the damage of the material. You can see the mold growing. I saw mold that I've never seen before in my life. Um, a lot of water damage. You can see there in the middle picture of the negatives. Um, that picture of stack of photographs in the middle top was literally glued together because of moisture. So we couldn't, we couldn't remove them. So we really had to actually move this archive away from the South Coast. Um, so I relocated and you can see here's our digitization setup. So I trained uh, three local guys to help me, three local students. And the whole community became involved as well. David helped, his wife helped, a lot of people around here who cares a lot for David and the archive became involved in helping us to do the digitization. Um, that was, of course, a challenge on its own, but I think it also showed how archive work can really bring communities together, how it can also fulfill a different function than just being a research project. Um, the archive, digitizing this archive down on the south coast, it was fun as well. It wasn't, it wasn't just hard work, but we had a, a monthly update in the local newspaper about how things are going. Um, people came to visit us a lot. They were musicians who heard their recordings of when they were young the first time in 40 years. It was quite a wonderful occasion. And I, I think the digitization project also pushed my memory work with David into a new realm. Because how we would set it up is that David would pack a box every night. And then the next morning, he would bring that box over to me or I would come and collect that box. And in that process of walking from his house to the digitization space, he would recount the stories of the material that is actually in that box. And I think within that, within those moments, really beautiful reflections on letting go, on memory, on growing older, and also on the kind of events that he was involved with um, were shared. And I, that's all now part of how we understand the archive and, and, and the archive record that we have to work with. Um, let me just check that I, um, okay. So let me actually, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, how do I do that? I don't know how to do that. Okay, anyway. <laughs> I'm gonna leave it like that, sorry, because we're running out of time. So let me just, I'm just gonna leave it as it is. Um, so with digitizing this big collection, I'm not actually going to talk about the standards or anything like that that we used. But what I would like to, what I would like to share with you, I wonder, I really do want to actually make it big. Um, I don't know how to do that. Anyway, okay. Um, what I would like to share with you is that we are now at a stage where we are compiling the metadata of all of this material that we digitized on the South Coast. But what we are finding is that actually finding a space to host all of this data, all of this material online is very difficult. So surprisingly, cultural repositories in South Africa are not really set up to deal with this amount of data. If you're a scientist, I don't think this is a lot. We're talking about 14 terabytes of, of, of raw material and four terabytes of actual user copies or things that you would upload onto a digital database. Um, and Stellenbosch University, for example, couldn't actually handle that amount of material. So what is happening is that we actually now have to make a selection of the content that we can host online because of space restrictions, which means that this collection is now being curated in another kind of a way, forced into its curation by the actual space that we have available. And what's also happening is that the way that I can curate this online is also structured and formed by the technologies that we have available. So part of the reason why I actually showed you all of these photographs and all of these processes was to highlight the fact that 
This archive is, um, ha, I found it. <laughs> this archive is actually quite unique in its organization. It's quite unique in the way that it was formed, um, in the way that David built it up throughout his life. There's various forms of decay in the archive. There's various networks that play into this archive. And these are all things that we have the possibility online or using the internet to actually show to users. So we can build systems where these networks and these intricacies and interactions between things become visible. The problem is that with infrastructure being expensive and building these things also being expensive, we, um, we're in a space where we have to use what is available. And that once again restricts the way that we can actually curate this material for users online. So I want to, I think I'm going to end there and, and, and ask you as, as, as a group to also help me think about ways you might even know of ways that these kinds of material can be curated online in ways that actually speak to the physical material to give users access to these kinds of organizations and organizational structures within the archive. So let me end there. I'm sure you have some questions as well, and then we can, yeah. You can maybe also guide me in my in my answers a bit. Thank thank you very much. I thought this was a wonderful uh, presentation. I mean, I, I know I've looked at parts of the uh, archive before, and I was already very much intrigued. Uh, but there's just so much in there. Um, it's really really nice. Mm -hmm. um, you had a question. Uh, I'm quickly checking if people also have questions. Uh, so if you have questions, just put them in the chat and we can uh, take them from there. I, I actually had, I have, I have a lot of questions. We can, <laughs> I think we can discuss for hours. Uh, I, I had two quick questions perhaps. So one thing that I never actually thought about, but right at the beginning, you mentioned something like archives are not really a fixed thing, right? They keep on, uh, developing and, and changing. Um, so something that in, in the field of humanities is now, or well, not just in the field of humanities, but in, in several fields is now um, a, a very a big discussion point is uh, rep, rep, replica, replication of research. So you do research on a particular object or a particular, well, say archive. Um, you don't want to have somebody else do essentially the same thing and they should, if everything works out well, get the same thing. But if the archive is developing, how, how do you think we can handle this? And that might actually be related to the choices that you now need to make, right? So what do you put online? What do you make available? Uh, what kind of influence does that have on, on doing research? So just to, just to understand your question, are you asking, um, that in, in, in a way that scholarship, so our research are sound enough that if someone else uses the same resources, they will get the same results. Exactly, yeah, okay. yeah. And, and that while the archive is still changing. So I think with an historical archive like Hidden Years, for example, is that your, um, <laughs> your historical facts are growing all the time. That doesn't mean that research that has been done is incorrect. It just means that we are actually adding to this record as we as we go along, I mean, my my understanding of this archive keeps on growing, and it is it's especially now having done this for ten years. At this point, it is really being influenced by people coming in and doing detailed research. So, someone would come in and say, "I'm working on Malombo, for example. Um, who were they? Where were they recorded? What was their journey? What was David's interaction with them?" And then digging into that we learn more about a certain a certain group. So I think it's not it's not correcting or disproving any research, but it's adding to our understanding of, of how, how events unfolded and what kind of things was possible for musicians to do during a certain time. So I think in, in, in that way, it's actually quite interesting because I, I wonder in 20 years time, if I'm still blessed to do this kind of work, what my understanding of this archive would be like then if I would actually be able to do a presentation like I did today, or if I would get stuck in all the nitty-gritty details of all of these stories that are there to tell. Yeah, no, I understand. So, but doesn't that then influence the question that you have? So what, how, how do you make a selection of what should be 
made available that on the one hand that, that limits the amount of or the, the kind of research that you're doing but it's so do you want to go in depth on a particular topic or do you want to show the breadth of the content of the archive and thereby missing the, the depth i think that's yeah um, i'm not sure if that was your question as well <laughs> but i think that that is something that you really need to think about yeah it is that is that is a constant it's a constant reminder when i do my work is exactly that question and for me as an archivist what i would prefer is to have everything up online so that you can make those choices hmm. i don't think i don't think it's my so right now my role as an archivist is quite it's quite um uh, what's the right word it's quite strong with this archive because it is it's not really available you can't come in as a researcher and do your own research i need to help you ideally you would be able to come in and do all of this by yourself but with the archive being so big we are restricted in terms of what is what i can actually provide access to at the moment I would like everything to be up. I would like 10 tons of material, including the curtain railings to be up online somehow. <laughs> you never know, it might, it might trigger you in a creative way to, to see the curtain railings. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. Uh, I see Tanya uh, asked the question as well. Have you never had a case that a certain conclusion had to be revised after more data or information was disclosed? Good question. Um, so not 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 particularly but i have had stories that for example how how, how a particular kind of event unfolded or who was involved or things like that have changed yes so there are instances where we do revise historical facts that is true um, we don't know everything and sometimes a story is told by someone and we take that as a fact because we can't verify it at this point and we can verify it later. So I suppose, I suppose it's, it's, it's <laughs> if we had an online system, I'm just thinking now, where we could build all of these layers onto each other and where we could go back and forward and revise things, that would be quite a strong, that would be quite a strong and quite wonderful way to actually Think of archival archival work. Sorry, someone just entered. <laughs> um, so yeah, we it does happen that I have to go back and revise. It does happen. Okay, I'm not sure if there are any other questions from the uh, from the audience. If I can just add something to what I've just said, though. Sure. I don't I don't think that's always necessarily a bad thing. We think about that, or we think about our research as always having to be. Um, if we think if we think of our work as academics in relation to archives that's always growing always changing it goes to say that our work as arc as, as academics will also keep on changing will keep on growing so it's 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 perhaps a, a controversial thing to say because these things are published as well and it becomes part of the public record in, in in some way or form so how to navigate that exactly i'm not not entirely sure but it it, it could also be a very creative space to actually be in this place where we revise things and where we learn more about what we do. It has taken me 10 years to start publishing on this archive. So I am I am aware of, of, of learning of these things continuously. Yeah, yeah, no, I fully understand. Uh, so I, I had another question, and again, that might be related to, to your question as well. Um, and also perhaps with uh, with how to do research on archives like these. So the archive, it, it's, so the first time we talked, I thought it was really just a musical archive. It was just recordings and, and that's it. And it is much, much more. So I didn't even know about the curtains. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how relevant these are, but if you have an archive of such a kind of multimodal um, uh, set of items uh, and because you're still busy digitizing, you're still busy, you're still working on finding the relationships between the items, etc. How do you how do you deal with these um, with, with, with these well different set of items? So just having recordings of music makes it in a way easy because you've got items that you can directly compare or you can directly analyze or whatever. Um, but how do curtains relate to? music to the 
uh, posters that we didn't even that you showed me last time that we didn't even yeah. see now. Um, how how do you put all of this together, and how uh, so is 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 that one of the ways how you select items now? Is it um, so, so if you need to make a choice of what can be available, and I, th I think I'm not asking a lot of questions at the same time. Um, but if you need to make a choice of the items that you make available, and you also need to show the the say the, the networks that are in that archive, um, how how do you do that? How do you relate these items to each other? Yeah, it's it's really difficult because also just if if we speak about just the sound recordings, for example, in this archive, so. I didn't tell you that story, but David was also followed by the security police and he was very aware that the musicians that he was recorded and having the actual recordings of the events could bring these musicians into trouble. So at one point he mislabeled things. So there would be a tape marked ABBA, but actually it would have Roger Lucy recordings in or it would have Sibo and, and Johnny. So even just within the actual sound recordings, it is very difficult to, um, to relate things to each other because we have to listen to what 10,000 tapes to actually get a sense of what is exactly there. Um, so my answer to you is that we play, that there is there's no safe scientific way to do this. I've tried numerous ways and they all work in, in to, to better or, or worse results, all of them. So thematically is one thing that we do. So. We are now busy with you with the project on on small cafes or small clubs and bars in Johannesburg. Okay. So that's one way to do that to focus our energy is to actually focus on thematics. Um, but I, the selections are are in a way um, <laughs> who said this curious and curious it's somewhere in a movie. But the selections are are idiosyncratic. They are um, I want to say um, what if like if, if you come across something by chance it's a it's a it's a very very beautiful organic process that has positives and negatives to it but we can't I can't I can't guarantee for example that if we make a selection of the market theater cafe that we have every single item in the archive related to the market theater cafe there will quite possibly be something that we miss. It might be a menu, it might be a tape somewhere in a box or, and of course that's not what you want as an archive. Um, but I think being aware that we have a role to play in the actual formation of this archive, I think it's, on, it's, it's good to be honest about these things and to speak about it openly. Um, and to also speak about that in relation to, if I, I, I use this word a number of times, but the magic of the archive, because, there's really something that happens, and this is something that I'm thinking about, but there's something that happens when you walk into the physical archive where you're drawn to a box or to a shelf or to something, and they are things because you're curious that triggers you and that you start playing with and things happen with that. Um, get the same thing should be able to happen in an online system where you are digitally walking into a space or moving into a system where you can start playing and start seeing things. Um, and I, I, I had to learn just one more thing, but I, I had to learn, it took me 10 years to learn this, that I will never have a conclusive idea of this archive. And it, it took a very long time to learn that because the thing is also David's memories and David's stories keeps a lot of these elements together. And I cannot tap everything in his brain. I cannot record all of his stories or all of his things. It's I used to honestly have my recorder on 24 seven when I went to visit him, it would just be playing all the time. So I have hours and hours and hours and hours of discussions, which is once again, a superfluous archive, it's too much, we can't actually engage with it. You can, but you can't, not with all of it. So we're always gonna miss things in any archive, actually. I'm yeah. just aware of what we miss in this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, so Tang actually just made a comment and I think that that's essentially the same thing you said. Uh, so she says, I don't think any archive is ever complete, so why strive for it? Um, I know it would be ideal, but you also have to be pragmatic. Yeah. I mean, okay. honestly, I, I, I suppose with this archive, because it is initially, I thought, it's one person, one journey, 
that there would be a way to actually have a conclusive story. But one person, especially a person like David, is linked to so many things, so many people, so many institutions and places and things. It's it's totally impossible. Yeah, yeah, I completely understand. Uh, I'm, I'm quickly looking at the clock. I see it's uh, 11 already. Um, so I, I, I very much liked this presentation. Um, you know, in the meetings that we've had before, I'm, I'm very interested in the archive as well. I really, I really love this. Uh, but your presentation was very, very interesting. It gives a, a nice insight, um, a view of the things that you're doing. So thank you very much for that. Um, I, I know that we can continue to talk for hours, um, but I think it's about time to stop people and have other appointments. Um, yeah, so let's let let's stop here unless there are uh, any more comments. Uh, very interesting. Uh, I see here in the chat. Um, so thank you very much again for the, for the presentation, uh, and I'm sure that we'll hear more about the archive. Thank you. And if anyone wants to get into contact, please do. It's it's lovely to talk to people. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>